I'm Renee Barnett. I'm Sean Holsell. And I'm James Martin. Welcome to What's Left. This is What's Left. When I said, hey, hey, what's wrong with you? And again, a big welcome, everyone, to our premiere show of What's Left, where we'll be discussing lots of issues relating to you and us, uh, the ordinary people, some of the things that are left out in the media, some of the things that are left out from discussion, trying really to understand why it is we live in the world that we live in today. Many different topics uh, coming up. We've got some really exciting shows uh, planned with some very exciting guests. Again, discussing topics uh, of interest to you. We've got Dr. Bandy Lee, uh, Mark Thompson, Bera Tomasi, amongst many others coming up in future shows where you can uh, find us on your nearest downloadable podcast uh, stream. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us about any show ideas or anything, really, um, anything that's come up in uh, discussion, um, whether you agree, disagree, we ask that we're all respectful to each other. But if you do want to get in touch, then please feel free to do so on info at newrennies.org. That's info at newrennies, N-E-W-R-E-N-N-I-E-S dot org. Um, for today's show, uh, we've got a few interesting uh, topics uh, coming from uh, healthcare to protests at the coronation, in, um, also including Susan Sarandon's uh, arrest just uh, a few hours from when we're recording. Yeah, together. we're actually uh, doing breaking news here on What's Left this morning. Uh, uh, it was a surprise to me when James mentioned uh, Susan Sarandon's arrest. I didn't, I hadn't heard about it yet. And uh, so I, I was hoping that James could fill us in a little bit about what that was all about. I understand that she was uh, protesting against uh, the horrible minimum wage laws here in the United States and, in you know, protesting in favor of a fair wage for everyone. Um, I'm not sure exactly how her arrest came down. James, did you hear a little bit more about it? Yeah, um, so for those uh, watching the show, you can see uh, the sort of moment of uh, uh, arrest for the actress Susan Sarandon, uh, as I say, uh, just a, a few hours ago. Um, she was um, essentially trying to support uh, uh, restaurant uh, workers um, who have been campaigning for better wages, um, and she, uh, her principal argument and involvement uh, in, I think they, they call it a, the fair wage organization. Um, the argument was essentially, uh, or her argument was that uh, uh, places um, like in retail uh, generally, but restaurant workers earning um, really low wages um, disproportionately affects women, single um, uh, mothers, and uh, specifically one of her arguments was around uh, single mothers of uh, of colour, uh, as you would say, in the United States. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, we were chatting a little bit before we, we went to air today, and I was thinking about the whole idea and about how difficult it is for families, uh, and especially single parents, to actually live in today's world. Uh, you know, especially in larger cities, where there is more employment for people. So they necessarily uh, are spending a lot of time in the bigger cities, but yet um, it, the, the cost of living in those cities is so outrageous that people just can't make it. And uh, it, it, it's, it's really a total disgrace. And as I was thinking about it this morning, I was thinking, you know, it's, uh, not to get too conspiratorial, but it's really right in our faces, uh, you know, by keeping people at a low wage, uh, keeping people down, in other words, 
you know, you keep them in despair and angry. And so that makes people more receptive to uh, extreme ideas and to violence and things like that. So I, it's like what we're hoping to do is just sort of give uh, a different view of things, a way of looking at things, and we welcome opposing views. We won't even all agree. Uh, the three of us, Sean, James, and I, won't even uh, constantly all agree. You may see us kick off here uh, a time or two, which I think is a lot of fun anyway. <laughs> it, it adds a little to, uh, uh, to the excitement of the subjects that we're covering. But uh, yes, uh, minimum wage is a big, big problem. Now, how does that, how do minimum wage here in America uh, stack up with uh, in other Western European countries where you guys are sitting? Sean? I, I was going to say, before we jump on to minimum wage, I think the bigger thing here is we've got protests and demonstrations protecting, trying to protect those most in need being criminalized whilst... Yes. It's completely legitimate for people like Jeff Bezos to to exploit exploit workers, extort mass profit out of systems, and, and that's completely fine. I think this is something gone drastically wrong with our political systems, where where that's fine, but yet demonstration and protest is, is criminalised. Is you mentioned Jeff Bezos, of course, you know the uh, head of Amazon and uh, a lot of other things. But we're talking about Amazon in particular and their sort of work conditions, uh, pay and, and all that sort of thing. And uh, it's oh, it, there it, are it, things going on in Amazon, some organization going on in Amazon. And we're hoping uh, to cover that uh, in a very soon upcoming show with some of the organizers that are involved in the Amazon realm. Well, this, this you know, the... The, the notion that uh, Bezos, if he were to have uh, given each Amazon worker a £50,000 pay rise um, in 2020, he would still be wealthier after the lockdown period, um, you know, the pandemic period, if you will. Um, he'd still be wealthier today, despite having given £50,000. So essentially, you know, workers are being driven uh, down um you know you you have uh, situations where people are now doing two or three other jobs there's no work life balance and you know even in the uk some of the protections to stop people from overworking um uh, are now under threat i mean if you if you look at you know the minimum wage in and across europe um i can say for example in france that um you receive around about 90% of your former wage if you find yourself unemployed. Uh, so it's not a comparison, really, uh, to uh, the UK, the US, or other places that have this sort of minimum uh, wage. Um, workers in uh, and around Europe uh, receive high wages. Uh, and yes, they pay a bit more tax for it, but, you know, uh, the services, you know, that people receive from healthcare right the way through to... Um, you know, civic beautification schemes, you know, to make places feel and look nice, um, all comes part and parcel of uh, of that taxation. If you you pay something, you you get something back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think France is head and shoulders above uh, many other countries that I happen to know about, and I've had personal experience with the French healthcare system, and I was just really amazed and, and pleased by that. And I've also seen and witnessed, you know, how they care for their people. And, uh, you know, James, you and I had a dear friend who uh, completed his life cycle a couple of years back. Um, and you and others were taking care of him during that time. And I was amazed to to come to visit and see that Every single day, uh, a nurse came around and did things uh, like obviously uh, giving medication and that sort of thing, but also just little things that he needed done. They would wash the dishes. They would just do every little thing um, in taking care of him. And I was so impressed by that. And that's 
there for every single French person, you know, or, or resident, legal resident of France, and it's it's just quite amazing. Well, that, that's it. The, the the approach to uh, to healthcare uh, in Europe is uh, is different. It's one of those uh, understandings that if you're sick. Um, that's not really helpful for someone else maybe living next door. Um, you know, there's a reason why we don't have private fire brigades uh, because your house sets fire. Um, well, if you're insured, they'll put your house out, but that doesn't help the house next door and then et cetera, et cetera. So it, that approach to healthcare is, you know, one of, um, you know, universal, you know, you don't have to be uh, looking for your contactless payment card uh, as soon as you picked up in an ambulance, uh, you know, you are looked after. And that I, that idea, regrettably, isn't uh, isn't available for well, everyone. I think what's happened in the United States is the, you know, the opposition to healthcare for all in this country uh, has been very successful at somehow making that seem like it's a bad thing, that... Um, you know, we don't want that. Then we'll have crappy health care. You know, our everything will go down. Uh, it, it, it's just it's just not true. And but I think that's they really have um, their messaging down on the uh, on the other side of this subject that makes people have a negative sort of knee jerk reaction to free services. And they're not really free because we all contribute to society. Um, but it, 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 I find that in, across the board in so many subjects that we could be talking about, uh, wages, healthcare, all that, it, it, there's a skewed view that's presented to the people. And it's, you know, they want to keep you down. They want to keep you angry. So that then you can be manipulated and then you can be, well, I mean, anyone can be manipulated. It's not people that are weak or stupid. It's people uh, given, you know, uh, the particular circumstances in their life, the particular state of mind, it could happen to any of us and, and does at various times. I mean, I, you know, I've certainly been fooled and hoaxed uh, in the past sometimes, you know, much more publicly than I would like. Uh, but, and I know it, it's very difficult when it happens, it's difficult to accept, but I think one of the things that uh, people should hopefully look at is, am I getting the full information? Is it possible that I'm being lied to? Is it possible that there's another way to look uh, at this subject? I think as well for me that America has this this pride in in the sense of freedom, and for me, you're much more free in a country where if you get cancer, you're not going to be riddled with death the rest of your life. I, I can't see how. Well, I how, think you're much more free in a country where you know you go to the mall and you don't run the risk of getting uh, mowed down with an AR-15. But uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It, yeah, it's it, it seems. I mean, for me, it seems a bit obtuse. It seems like there is unlimited freedoms for companies to make profit and, and profiteer off people, and and these healthcare companies and insurance companies are profits off people when they're at the very lowest point in life, often, and then you get saddled with debts, and then there's the the extra stuff with that, the mental health stuff. If you're spending your time worrying and stressing how you can pay for this treatment, how are you ever going to get better? If, if you've not got that, you have a much better chance of recovery and, and living a, a long and fulfilled life. And, and this is uh, one of the uh, the key things. I was uh, speaking to someone uh, just a few days back. Um, actually, it was a, a radio interview. And, um, you know, one of the uh, very different topic, but, you know, I was sort of asked, you know, why, why do you think people get angry about particular topics and said, well, in essence, people are, and very deliberately at each other's throats um, and the people who aren't are the people who are laughing all the way to the bank. You know, there's much more that unites us than divides us. And one of the symptoms is, you know, it, it, it takes so much energy to be hateful and angry 
Uh, and yet people are because mm -hmm. they, they see this other group or, you know, this other religion or this other belief or whatever it is as being the sole reason for, for their misfortune. And actually, you know, if you just lift your head out of the sand and begin to see that for healthcare, uh, for example, and everything else, um, you know, you, you've got politicians who start off, you know, we need universal health care. So this is in the States as much as it is elsewhere. Uh, and then suddenly they have this Damoclean conversion. Uh, and it's not too long before you realise they've made a substantial donation to some political fund, to some campaigning fund. And so people end up uh, losing out. And, you know, one of the things you, you, you were saying before, Renee, about... Um, uh, you know, uh, people look for someone to blame and this hate fuel. I mean, the, the other side of that, though, you know, away from the extremes, is the absolute apathy. You know, poor, frightened uh, people tend not to use their vote to change a system for fear of losing what little they have. Mm. And we see this from the United States, Canada, uh certainly in the uk nowadays anyway um that you know people you know we've just had some local elections in the uh, in the uk and yeah, sorry to bring that up sean but um the, the turnout uh i mean sean i don't know if you want to talk about turnout uh whether for yeah uh, jay's referencing jay's referencing there i'm i'm a local councillor in local government in the uk uh, the turnout in my wards, where the, the area I represent, a sort of district, uh, was 28.1%. So less than one in three people exercising their right to pick who who does have an impact. I mean, we, we do have an impact in local government over stuff that matters to people, the bins, streets being cleaned, potholes in the road, the state of, of some sort of local health care. Uh, these are things that have an impact and... and um, I mean, I'm certain the people I've helped over the last four years and, and will continue to over the next three would would recognise as there's a difference in a value in, in having people who care about the community in these positions. But yeah, turnout in local elections is, is around about 30%. I mean, even in general elections in the UK, between 60 and 65% last few. I mean, that's still one in three people not, not deciding to exercise their right and elect mm -hmm. people to represent them and, and yeah it's, it's and, and, and of course what what then happens when i've heard saying when i'm teaching which is if you don't know what your rights are they'll be taken away and so we've just found in the uk two million people perhaps higher i tend to agree with uh, uh the trade union uh research on this um um with the institute of uh, uh was it uh, workers' rights, I think, I can't remember, uh, employment rights. Uh, it was suggested that 4 million people have actually have been disenfranchised with the introduction of ID cards. Mm -hmm. So for a majority <laughs> of people, oh, that's yeah. not a problem because uh, a majority of people in local elections don't vote or, well, I don't know, they, they couldn't vote this time. So whether they suddenly wanted to, we don't know. And again, uh, you know, in national elections, um, We've now, you know, a third of people, you know, it's the largest party, the don't vote party, uh, essentially. And again, I think that ties into um, the economic reality that people live, uh, find themselves in. I think, too, it, 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 at least in terms of, of here in the U.S., it has been a tendency for people to certainly vote more in the general election, in the, you know, national elections, and, you know, don't think too much about maybe skipping the, you know, the local elections and that sort of thing. But what we've seen is that was a huge, huge mistake because behind the scenes, these local governments and state governments have been uh, working to enact laws that are just draconian um, and setting things up in a way that really affect people's lives in terms of healthcare, in terms of wages, in terms of everything. And, um, you know, big mistake, not paying attention to the local 
elections because they're important and they're more important now than ever. As we got to do things from, you know, a grassroots level and that's where it all begins in your local areas. You know, it's like people, uh, I don't know what, uh, what can be done to draw more attention to those things and have people sort of wake up to the fact um, that those elections are just as important and in some ways may be uh, more important than the national elections. And for me, I, I'm not someone who, who thinks that any politicians owed a vote by someone. I think it's up to us, us to go out and, and demonstrate that we're worth voting for. I don't think... I'm owed anyone's vote. I think we, we should be made to earn it. We should be made to demonstrate that that we're not of the political class that, that are just ignoring them, get elected, turn the back mm. on the community and disappear. We, we should be rooted in the communities and we should be representing representing people at a grassroots level and rather than, than talking down to them, helping empower them and giving them the skills they need to sort of build from the ground up in different community groups and supporting each other. Well, I know you were more than successful in your in your last race, Sean. Um, and I think it was probably largely due to the fact that you were out there on the ground, knocking on doors, shaking hands, talking about uh, the things that people care about. And I think that means a lot uh, to voters to feel like that they're heard, that it, and somehow in this country, that sort of thing has, we've gotten away from it so much in favor of the big rallies and, you know, getting on TV and running ads and, and all of that. But just getting down with people and seeing what they really care about. How are you going to know unless you're really talking to the, the real people that are affected? Well, that's, that's it. I mean, it, you've just hit on something there, which is, you know, the TV ads. You know, always remember there's no such thing as public opinion, just published opinion. Um, so, yeah. you know, tell wagging the dog, if you find politicians creating an issue, they're perhaps not listening to a lot of people. And uh, just having a look at the local elections in the, the UK, which formally concluded today, actually, the last council of Redka uh, in the northeast uh, declared um, not a, uh, a happy day for some of them of uh, right wing uh, um yeah councillors who lost uh, some seats but um it's you know what we found is these issues uh, relating to uh oh in the uk we've got the the issue of uh people coming over the channel in boats i don't know whether one of them have read some you know norse saga and think mm -hmm. you know oh, the vikings are coming kind of thing um snowflake all of that nonsense uh, whatever uh that actually means uh, but when you break down the areas where the local adverts were all about those issues that's where you find the ruling conservative party in the uk got absolutely tranched uh i mean you know they uh, there's, there's no mistaking at all they they really did hemorrhage uh what 1063 council seats um you know that's quite heavy losses uh so these weren't the issues facing people the cost of living the how to uh, put sausages on plates you know how to pay for petrol you know the things that actually are politics um you know uh they they mattered and you know for those uh where there was dramatic change in the makeup of those councils campaigning those issues seem to have worked absolutely yeah i and again i, I knocked more doors than i can remember now and spoke to more people but those issues those sort of dog whistle issues weren't weren't the thing it is how can i afford to keep the lights on the heat on a roof over my head how can i afford to keep food on the table make sure my kids are safe because we've got to look at the stark reality that the kids born now are going to be worse off than their parents and that, that's something that's completely alien to to most of, of the world, certainly America, Europe, and, and Great Britain. And we've, we've politicians just don't seem to recognise that they're getting bogged down in, in weird sort of entrenched battles that, that don't affect normal people in, in this country or, or indeed in America. And we've got to realise that we, we have to, we're going to speak to voters. 
and, and people. We've, we've got to talk about issues that matter, and that's, at the minute, the economy and how we structure work because it's, it just isn't working for people. We're being more and more exploited. We have worse jobs. We've got automation coming down the line in AI, which is going to shift things even more dramatically. Yeah, I, I, I totally uh, I totally agree. Um, it's not just um, yeah, it, it's not just uh, automation. Um, that notion that society will be worse off with future generations is that I worked out actually uh, certainly in the UK. The last time that happened was following uh, well the Battle of. Uh, Waterloo. Um, so you have to go back really to 1815 before you see a generation that was poorer uh, after than before. Um, now, there, there are lots of ways to measure progress. And when we're talking about the economy, really what, what we're referring to is your ability to survive. You know, if everyone is a paycheck away from homelessness or thereabouts, um, you know these mat- uh, you know these issues of work and decent wages must be in your top priorities, uh, and they they are when you speak to people. You know, I haven't yet met someone who said, uh, "Oh, someone's pronoun is the reason they, uh, um, you know, you know, are not having a pay rise this year." I, I just haven't met anyone like that. Uh, maybe that's the people I hang around with. Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure at all. Uh, Renee, yeah. if we, it looks like we've got a special guest. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm having dog problems. Uh, the joys of live uh, live broadcasting. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this is spiky. And um, I'm having a little trouble with Bijou over there in the corner. Normally, they just sleep right through. But, of course, someone's outside working in their yard and you know, so that's all of their business. They, they've they got to see what's going on. So forgive me. I'll try to mute them out anytime uh, I hear them making a, a noise. But anyway, <laughs> I feel like certain other hosts that always have a cat walking across their desk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and a glass, glass of champagne when they uh, get an extra thousand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, For me, it's just only dogs and coffee. <laughs> yeah. was, as soon as I said, uh, tail wagging the dog. Um, <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I kept trying to push him down, but he keeps wanting to stick his head up. So, but, but anyway, yeah, the, the whole, uh, the whole wage thing is really crazy. Now, the um, what are the are there some new laws there in the UK uh, about protesting and people not being able to protest anymore? I mean, I see those laws changing here in the United States on local on the local levels. You know, certain states, certain cities, and um, you know that really uh, is a foreboding sign as far as I'm concerned, if we're trying to just shut everyone up, um, you know, from being able, I mean, it sort of smacks of, you know, Putin land and Russia and that sort of thing where we're not, you know, people talk about we're here in the United States because we're free, you know, but, you know, of course I've been other places where I have felt not one whit less free uh, than I do here in the United States. Uh, and people here are under a lot of false impressions about um, other places and how much it's sort of a, you know, an indoctrination that we were given as kids. I remember in elementary school, you know, being taught America's number one, you know, we're the best in the world. And anywhere you go in the world, everybody's going to love you because you're an American. And, uh, had a little bit of a rude awakening when I was able to grow up and do some traveling. <laughs> Just wasn't quite that way. <laughs> People don't necessarily give you a pass just because you are from the USA. And in fact, it can be a detriment sometimes, depending on who's in office at that time in our administration and other other factors. Well, you have but, the added advantage of pretending you're Canadian, I suppose. But uh, I have done that, you know. Uh, 
in, in times gone by, I was advised to do that one time when I went to Europe because we just had such a bad reputation. I believe it was during the, you know, Iraq war days. Yeah, and it, I, I would have to say it, and understandably, wasn't uh, an ideal time to be traveling uh, uh, as uh, someone from Britain uh, due to uh, uh, Tory Blyer. Uh, yes. Sorry, yes. I can't, I've str uh, struggled pronouncing his name correctly. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, the right of protest is one of the fundamental. Um, arguments and fundamental struggles actually that have uh, uh, been made by uh, mankind in various different uh, guises in various different times um, against tyranny effectively and despotism um, you know it ranges from the uh, the uh, the act of protesting something unpopular right the way through to well revolution um, you know and that entire span. As soon as you try and ban people from exercising their right to say something, and again, I repeat, just because you disagree with someone doesn't mean, you know, they're invading the Rhineland. It just means you disagree. Disagreeing with people is the way that you form opinions or solidify your own ones. It's no reason to go out and shoot someone. It's no reason, uh, you know, to go and remove other people's rights, uh, if they're not infringing on yours, you just leave it as it is. Uh, protest, you know, try and change the way that people think through uh, words, not weapons. And in the UK, that has completely, uh, and the, the, the irony isn't lost when in on one breath you hear a minister say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're sending so much aid to Ukraine because, you know, they're fighting against tyranny. But in the next sentence is, well, we've effectively uh, banned people uh, from protesting. Um, and I'll, I'm just going to say this. Um, the In uh, the past few days, um, Charles Windsor has had a new hat installed. Um, we call it the coronation. I have my own views on uh, the royal family. Um Irrespective of those views, um, people were discussing with the police, um, as we now understand today, uh, even sending voluntarily some of the placards that they were about to uh, use uh, in protest of the coronation because they firmly believe that Britain should be a republic. Uh, should have a, an elected head of state or, in fact, not having a head of state uh, at all. Um, and I'll just show you some scenes, and then, Sean, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but uh, some of the images are quite literally as the uh, campaign group called Republic. As soon as they um, arrived, and if you're watching this program, you, you'll be able to see this uh, if you uh, do a search um, on Google or something like this. But what you can see is uh, they are unloading signs that say, not my king. And minutes after that, um, initially six people, then I understand that doubled, um, uh, were arrested for crimes they had yet to commit. I'll just repeat, no crime had been committed. And the Metropolitan Police in the UK uh, have admitted this. They've said, oh, well, after 16 hours detention... Uh, in a prison cell, we actually didn't have any reason to uh, to arrest you in the first place. And for me, that seems to be premeditated. I think this was uh, directions from the... Uh, well, you, you guys in the States, we call it the Minister for the Interior. Uh, we call it the, uh, the Home Secretary. Um, Sean, I don't know if, if you know that. Yeah, I, I think as soon as you start making it illegal to protest, you, you get in some very dodgy territory. I mean, especially with this, where where there was constant contact with the police, uh, the, the whole plan demos was told to them. For, I think it was months and months before, to the best of my understanding. Yeah, last year. And even the, the placards aren't really the most offensive thing anyone's ever seen on the streets of Britain. Certainly not the most offensive thing I've seen at a protest. But by... by 
sort of removing that voice, you it is painting a picture that, that this country is something that isn't that that the people with those views don't exist. And and as we know from recent polls that amongst young people it's there isn't that much support for the monarchy anymore. I think it, it's going to be very different with Charles at the head rather than, than his mum. Well, speaking of Charles's head, the uh, uh, tragic irony wasn't lost on me uh, that uh, each preceding King Charles has been associated with crackdowns and removal of rights and uh, all of this. And um, I'm sure those who are familiar with history, uh, well, Charles the first came to a bit of a, uh, a sticky end as a uh, result of this. And, you know, ultimately Charles the uh, second uh, very nearly did um, because of uh, various countdowns. If you, rem- you know, and it, the again, you know, if it wasn't for those um, clampdowns, you know, uh, making illegal people's, uh, you know, just rights to protest, but uh, to express um, a view, I suppose the United States wouldn't have ever been formed in, in the way because a lot of those people who were protesting uh, uh, were sent to, well, Britain's first prison colony, as it was uh, after Ireland, uh, was the United States for just having a different opinion, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, and and with respect to the coronation and, and the royal family, you know, it's odd that, you know, we did, uh, our ancestors did come over to sort of escape the rule of the king and uh, and the church, basically, the Church of England. And it, it, it's, it's funny that we now have this romanticized view of the royal family. I think a lot of people here in the United States would have a positive view of the whole thing. Uh, we don't have anything like that here, of course. And, you know, going back through history and, and all the pomp and circumstance that's, uh, in, you know, involved in things like the coronation and the Queen's Jubilee and all these other, uh, the royal weddings and things, we all sort of look from afar and think, wow, look at that, princesses and and that sort of thing. But uh, for myself, I just have this, so, this whole knee-jerk uh, reaction to the idea that just by simple virtue of the fact of who you were born to that you're somehow given somehow uh, some kind of extra credit extra acknowledgement and you must be revered and respected and obeyed just because of how you were born and not because of your character and the your good works through your life and, and that sort of thing I've got a bit of a problem with that, you know, although I do have that little bit of fairy tale side on the, uh, you know, you know, Cinderella and all the uh, right. stories of, uh, of the balls and things like that, that still I can get a little bit. I think uh, over, but... it was Monty Python uh, who said uh, some watery tart distributing swords isn't an effective means of government. Um, <laughs> you know, um, to help, help I'm being repressed. Bless them. Um, Bless Monty Python. Yeah, um, it, it is, it's unusual. And certainly if you look at the, again, the media who uh, portrayed, oh, well, you know, you have these royal correspondents, the, the royal carriage is traveling down the royal lane. With the royal sword and the royal and everything, well, well. and it is a bit of a kick in the teeth where we have um, healthcare workers in our national health service on uh, strike for uh, they have received pay cuts each year since 2010, 35 percent, if not higher, higher, but 35 percent is the figure um, that they've lost in pay since uh, 2010, whilst. Um, you know, a, a man and woman uh, wearing gurman with gold and diamonds um, takes two hundred and fifty million pounds uh, from the taxpayer uh, to have a hat installed. It's uh, it's a bit jarring, and especially given the fact that the you know the British royal family is the wealthiest family on this planet. 
you know, they, they have an annual income, I think it was 2.6 billion and they don't get taxed on it. Um, it's staggering. It, it makes no sense to me, but you know, I wasn't born under a monarchy. I, I was Renee, and it makes no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but do you get, Sean, what I'm saying about the sort of nostalgic uh, view that I think they play to with people? Um, this is your queen, your king, you know, like we're all in this together, but it's really not. You better not go up and try to touch him, you know, uh, that sort of thing. It's, it's, do you find, do you see anything about it that sort of like sends you back to days gone by and sort of a wistful feeling uh, or anything like that? Or have you no. always felt this way? I've never really been interested, if I'm honest. Uh, my family history, my, my grandmother came to this country from Ireland to work in the NHS. Uh, so it's it's not been steeped through through like the family any sort of monarchist attitude. Mm. Uh, I, I've I've never really understood it. I've probably never really even thought about it properly until sort of last mid twenties when I probably started thinking about about how our country is structured. But it's it is it's it, it inbuilt inequality into this country. While we've got one family who, by virtue of the birth, are entitled to to sort of unrivaled wealth and, and hereditary titles and castles and whatnot that, that are automatically better than the rest of us. It, it, it kind of yeah. it halts the rest of progress in, the, in this country, I feel. But I, I would say, though, that when you said there's not really anything in America similar, I would say the, the sort of celebrity culture sort of mirrors... You know, I was just it. thinking that in the back of my mind as you were talking... That's what we have. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know that we've, and it wasn't always quite this way. Uh, it was always the sort of American ideal was, you know, the guy that, you know, pulls himself up by his own bootstraps and goes out there and makes it and in America. You can do that. You know, if you work hard, you can, you know, you can be president of the United States. Well, that's true. But there was a point where we stopped sort of revering that ideal and instead became enamored uh, with the rich and famous. And, you know, I was speaking with someone the other day about this. And I remember back in the mid nineties when reality television became what it is today. Uh, it, that's when it started changing. Prior to that time, reality television uh, was anything that was not news, that was real. Um, you know, documentaries were reality television. Uh, you know, news magazines with, uh, you know, focus on women or focus on the paranormal or whatever. Those were called reality because they were done you know, with real people and not scripted. Everything unscripted and not news was considered reality TV. Then around that time along came the Kardashians. And the success, the rapid success, and the admiration that people started giving them for basically doing nothing you know, they, the, the, the joke was at the time, you know, Kim Kardashian was famous for being famous. And really the only thing that, you know, got her well known at the time was the, you know, the sex tape that came out with her and, and her ex-boyfriend. And I really always suspected and still do that she was the one who leaked it in the first place because she's had nothing but success uh, since that happened. And um, but that's when we began to start, uh, you know, being enamored with, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous uh, and the the real housewives, the apprentice with Donald Trump. You know, all those shows 
they started, you know, shifting our focus of what we consider success to be strictly associated with money and fame. This is, I mean, it's really interesting for me because um, it's about this time you have this, uh, you know, what I call the great decoupling. And I think we were talking about this uh, last night, uh, this decoupling of um, earnings, reality, productivity, this great decoupling where people are asked to do more and more for, for less and less. And I think one of the reasons for that, because this was the same in, in the UK, uh, when I, you know, if you were to ask anyone, you know, what was the first reality show, um, I think you would, you'd hear the words Big Brother. Um, and it, I noticed, I mean, if, you know, if I ever could go back and change what I've studied, anthropology would be there, because it seems that as people were getting poorer, they started becoming obsessed with escapism. You know, look at what they could have. Maybe, maybe we could have it one day. And it, it, this sort of fantasy. And it take it took a few years, I think. But eventually, what happened was they cottoned on to um, uh, this idea that people were, you know, I don't want to say fantasizing, but this escapism. Um, and they started doing the news stories. They started doing the look at, um, uh, you know, what breakfast they're eating and, you know, doing all of this. And so we, we reflect on today's society and it's, um, you know, people are um, essentially, you know, obsessed with, oh, well, they're eating quinoa, uh, you know, or they're, eating, they're, they're having scrambled egg frittatas. So maybe that's what I have to have in order to uh, sort of ignore the reality of a situation. I think that we can go further back. I think the Kardashians and Trump and all that, they're symptoms of a problem. They're not the cause of the problem. I think the shift in sort of like post-war America, certainly, and then a bit later in Britain, from well, to neoliberalism to sort of rampant free market capitalism, producing stuff to break quickly and, and pile it high, get people consuming as much as possible is what leads to to reality shows and, and things like that. But I think without that neoliberalism being injected into America and then a little bit later, Britain, and rampant consumerism and people's worth being placed on how much shit they can buy, I think that is, that's where the problems start. And then it, it ends up with, with us having to sort of like capital consuming itself through, through media and, and yeah. trying to sell more more stuff we don't need, which isn't going to make us happy, but gives us that sort of short-term serotonin boost. And I, I think, yeah, but the stuff in the 90s certainly sort of like put it into the next gear. But I think this this goes yeah. back to, to sort of how we recover from the depression and the wars and, and stuff like that and us making a fundamental mistake in, in what we do. I think you're right, you know, and, and, and really that... Uh the advent of these types of shows that, that we're talking about, the Kardashians and, and others, uh, you know, it, it couldn't have started there. That has to be, you know, sort of a symptom and, 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 and a warning for, you know, what was to come. Uh, but I think that, uh, I think you're absolutely right. We had to be conditioned and, and ripe for that, uh, for it to have, ever worked for for it to have become successful we as a society were ready you know unfortunately for that type of of thing and in 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 but again you know to come back full circle uh when i you've got um we're sort of back to you know uh you know uh, please if you're going to email and complain it, this is just a phrase uh, the old wives tales uh uh, Wives don't have tails. That is oh. definitely a myth. <laughs> oh, self, do more research. Um, but um, it was the uh, you, you see with uh, with healthcare the uh, the rise of the sort of home remedies. Um, I saw an advert. Uh, I think I shared it with uh, you and I about trying to get sunlight into your veins to cure your 
of something and some contraption you could put on your head for fifteen thousand dollars and it cure all of your ailments. Um, and you, you know, and and Where various, did they get that idea? I wonder. I, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, no one famous has uh, said it uh, <laughs> that I can think of. Um, but again, you know, this sort of um, you, you know, Sean's mentioned neoliberalism, you know, deregulation, but the planned obsolescence, in other words, buy more to help you feel better, you know, but keep doing these jobs that, you know, are grinding you down, no work life balance or anything. And then if you can't afford healthcare, um, you then have, uh, well, uh, buy this uh, and it will cure you. And just to, just to say, you know, this isn't, you know, just a symptom of things in the United States. In the in the UK, the Conservative Party removed dentistry from our NHS. It used to be free. And now what we see, uh, other than the fact that uh, I think it was something like 60% of the UK population doesn't have access to a dentist. Um, oddly enough, you've seen the rise of do-it-yourself kits. Watch a YouTube video and give yourself a filling. And no, that isn't a euphemism. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, oh, affix something to your teeth, you know, these it, uh, like temporary teeth and all of this. And it, it's not addressing the problem. It's trying to, you know, uh, pardon the pun, capitalize uh, on uh, people's uh, uh, ill fortune. If we did have uh, universal health for dentistry, um, you know, that would be one thing in the UK. Um, but instead, no, no, it's it's better to buy the, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of filling kit than, you know, try and argue for something else. You know, what about mental health care uh, in the UK and, and in France, if you know? Um, you know, that's one thing here that even if you have... Uh, you know, coverage for health insurance, the mental health care is not very good uh, here. And I know that we're having a mental health crisis in the United States. Uh, I suspect uh, it's not the only place in the world. You know, some people are blaming the, you know, the isolation of the pandemic and that sort of thing as being a contributor. I see a lot of things as contributing to our overall mental health uh, uh, decline. Uh, what kind of uh, system do you have there? Is it just, you know, I know you have NHS and national health system in uh, in the UK and then France, of course, has theirs. Uh, are, well, do they provide for mental health care? Yeah, uh, I'll just answer on the, uh, from the uh, French perspective. Yeah, the Mutuel um, uh, essentially one of the sort of insurances that you have, uh, which are ridiculously cheap, covers uh, mental ill health, um, physical health. For example, if you have, uh, well, I know you do, Renee, uh, three dogs. If you find yourself ill, be that physically or psychiatrically, um, the mutual will, will cover you. Uh, certainly mine does um, mm -hmm. for someone to come and look after the, the animals while you're uh, That's away. crazy. Um, the other thing, if I was a full-time worker, let's say in France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy for the time being, um, Scandinavia, but I'll just focus on Germany and France. Oh, I've forgotten Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, but I'll just focus on France and Germany. If you, uh, go to your doctor and your doctor diagnoses you as being stressed due to work-related activity or stressed in any way, then in Germany and France, you'll be written a prescription to go to a health spa. Um, it's six weeks in Germany. I think it's four weeks or thereabouts in, in France. And that's not a sort of optional thing. That you're written off work, you go. Right. Um, and in fact, there's some advances um, of taking employers to court for causing what's called a psychiatric injury. Um, so that's the situation in Europe. Uh, as for NHS mental health services uh, uh, collapsing, Sean, I don't know if uh, you want to. Yeah, I mean, the NHS is, is something we should all be proud of, but it's it's 
criminally underfunded. Uh, I think as well with a lot of the mental health services being relatively new, newer than, than the more fundamental stuff that the NHS was built on. Uh, I think that's going to be the most misunderstood area and, and therefore easiest to, to underfund even more so before we start looking at, at general hospitals. I think though that, that a lot of the mental health problems we see in society, the, the symptoms of a wider problem, which which a lot of it can come down to just financial hardship, being forced to spend more time away from your loved ones working, working often two, three jobs to keep a roof over your head. None of this is how we were supposed to survive as, as people. We need community. We need to be with our families. It's not, it's not healthy to spend 12 plus hours a day at work mm breaking your body down both physically and mentally and then come home and expect to just reset and be okay. It's, I think we need to look at how we structure ourselves as a society rather than just trying to always address the symptoms. I think it's, it's the wrong way to look at it. We need to look at the root cause of these problems. Well, there's few animals uh, that we share this planet with, for example, who put themselves through you know, eight to 12 hours of intensive stress um to survive i mean if 